With this lecture, we're going to take a look at the art of early medieval Europe and at the Romanesque style. We'll begin with our discussion by talking about early medieval European art. If you look closely at the map, you'll see all these different lines and arrows in different colors. These represent the various tribes and factions that migrated across Europe during the early medieval period. And we're talking about 400 AD, roughly that period. Now, these are non-Roman cultures, and they were classified altogether as barbarians. The reason this term was given to the barbarians is because the Greeks and Romans said that they barbled the language of Greek and the languages of Greek and Roman. So that's an easy way to remember that the term barbarian means barbled language, and it's a derogatory term used to group together these diverse uh, cultures and societies that migrated across Europe in the first four or five hundred years after the death of Christ. Now as we consider the art of this period we'll look primarily at the art that was created in monasteries because the monasteries were the seats of learning and of artistic pursuits and much of this art was done with no credit to the artist but really credit to the divine impulse. One of the main sources of art is in manuscripts, which can also be called illuminated manuscripts. During the Middle Ages, artists did not sign their work, and individual artistic expression was discouraged. Instead, one outlet for creativity was in these handwritten manuscripts made by monks. These two examples are from around 600. These surviving manuscripts all of them are important historic and artistic relics. Now I want you to note the symmetry of these designs. Symmetry is something that we see a lot in the early work, both in the jewelry and in the manuscripts. Now let's talk about one particular work. This is a page from the Book of Kells, and it's actually um, in Latin presenting the beginning of the story of Christ from the Gospels. Now, this is so over the top that it's really hard to even read. But when we look at the jewelry of the time, which was often had secular purposes as well as religious purposes, it's easy to see the origins of this artwork. Now, the jewelry often came from non-Christian influences, from the pagan influences, and then it was used in a secular, I mean, in a more spiritual context, in a religious context, in these manuscripts. Now, the Book of Kells is one of the most famous surviving manuscripts, and I'm going to run through a few facts so you can get the idea of this undertaking. This um, book is from, was made in Scotland, and it was created on vellum, which is calfskin, and that's the primary uh, material that they did the books on. There's four accountings of the life of Christ in this document. And the piece itself is an icon in its own right, and the book would have been worshipped rather than probably carefully read. There's a theory that the monks were supposed to strengthen their spiritual connection by trying to read these books because they were so decorative and not so easy to read. Now, one of the things that we know about this is that one book took four scribes and three major painters to create and 185 calves for the vellum. In modern times, it would take the scribes, oh, about a month to do a single page. So now we're going to look at another book from similar time period called the Lindisfarne Gospel Book. Now, this book is unique in that 250 years after it was created, there was a monk, his name was Aldred, and he decided to write the history of how it was created so we know a lot more about it than we do about many of the other books. Oh, it took 300 calfskins to make this one and they got their pigments from as far away as the Himalayas. Now that is quite the undertaking when you consider the time period that we're talking about. So if we just look at this and analyze this, you can still see Roman influences, but it's an odd little abstract work of art. Note that the footstool is floating. There's not really perspective, as we might have seen in the past. I like that the angel is sitting on the guy's head. I mean, that makes it really clear. He is inspired. This is Matthew. 
Now the figure peeking out from behind the curtain, one of the things that's interesting about him is that there's no room for his body. He's, it's kind of a floating head, really. And there's a dispute. Is it Moses or is it Jesus? Well, we'll actually, we'll never know. But this is a great example of the abstraction that was starting to happen in art, even as it was being influenced by the Romans that had come before. So let's talk now about jewelry. That, these are some of the artifacts that have survived that tell us the most about the art of the period. Now this one that we're looking at here is from Scandinavian origin. Scandinavia consists of Denmark, Norway, and Sweden, and this region was never part of the Roman Empire. They had a unique abstract style that dated back to prehistoric times. In, in this piece, it's a little bit hard to see in the slide, but it represents the animal style, in which animals were abstracted and included as an important part of designs. Now here's some points that you want to remember about the animal style. These pieces tend to be symmetrical, so they're the same on both sides. And they show the animals in profile or looking at them from above. Now one really interesting fact is that they often show the bones, the skeletons of the animal, like the ribs will be protruding or their shoulders will be really sticking out as if they're seen in profile. So there is, this is a Norse brooch called the Gmersmark brooch. So now let's look at another work. So here we have the Sutton Who Hinged Clasp. Now you might think, who cares? This is just a piece of metal. Well, if you look closely, this is an incredibly decorated clasp, and what it was for was to hold leather armor in place. The origin of this is from the Celts and the Anglo-Saxons. Now, they invaded Britain from Germany, and they really took over the whole islands, and their influence was quite strong on the art and the culture of the period. In the literature at the time, there's references to this magnificent jewelry that was worn by the upper class of these cultures. There's an epic tale called Bo Beowulf, and in this tale, they describe a hero's burial, and he was heaped with precious stones and treasure. Well, you know, they found such a burial in Sutton Hu. Now, Hu means hill, so it's the Sutton Hill Burial where they found this little ditty of a piece of jewelry. Now, the, the man who was buried there was buried in a ship. It was a 90-foot ship. So think about how big 90 feet is, how long that would be. And it was a rowing ship. So it wasn't a sailing vessel. It was to be rowed, um, which is kind of magnificent in itself. Now, if you look closely at this, I think it's hard to see, but there's snakes and boars in included in the designs. So the boar was important because it represented the strength and the bravery that would be needed by the person who'd be wearing the armor. So this is just a small item, but it's gorgeously created. It's a really magnificent piece, and it represents this ship that was buried full of treasure from the period. One of the more idealized and uh, lesser uh, uh, a society that we know less about would be the Vikings. Now the Vikings were Norsemen from Norway that were seafaring and there was they would go out with as many as 350 ships on their excursions and usually conquer a people but they also brought a lot of culture to the people to where they settled in their own rough way. They would intermarry and intermingle throughout the European coast. The earliest incursion or attack that we know of by the Vikings is in the very place, Lindisfarne, where we just were looking at the Gospels from. Um, that's a monastery that was invaded by the Vikings in the year 793. Now, as the Vikings made their way around Europe, several of the different uh, aristocracies, the rulers, made agreements with them. For example, in France, they were given the this area of Normandy to settle because that's Norse for the Normans and there you go that's the Vikings. Now the Swedish Vikings went up into Russia and Constantinople where they were recruited to guard the palace and to guard the king and a group called the Rus went into Russia 
and helped to create the country that we know of as Russia today. Now in uh, Viking society, the women were pretty important and they were definitely the masters of fiber arts. They would weave sails and braid ropes and do um, many these elaborate wall hangings and tapestries, some of which still survive in pieces today. What we're looking at here is known as a stave church. Now the Norse men were they were really famous for building these beautiful wooden structures they would either make them with these horizontal logs that's a lot like the log cabin that we know of or they would stick the logs straight into the ground <clears throat> to rise perpendicularly out of the ground and make what is known as a palisade now because these structures were built of wood most of them are gone but this is one of the examples that remains throughout Norway there's some of these churches now these are so beautiful when you look at them from the exterior. They recoat them with a kind of a tar to keep them waterproof and to preserve the wood. But if you consider the interior, there's no windows. They're very dark. Now one of the things that I read that was really interesting, that, on, that is on all the gables, they were protected from evil spirits by either snakes or crosses. So I like that because they covered their bases with that. During the second half of the 8th century, there was a ruler named Charlemagne, and he created an empire that's known as the Carolingian Empire. Now, at its height, this empire stretched throughout Europe. It covered a vast area of Europe, and Charlemagne uh, enforced Christianity upon the people that were settled there. So this really helped to further the spread of Christianity and one of the relics that we have from this period is this little statue. Now it's pretty small, it's under 10 inches tall, but it's known, it's, um, it, you can really see the Roman influence here, although you can also see the changes that have happened since the Roman times. Now originally this was thought to be Charlemagne himself, but it's probably not. It's probably his grandson known as Charles the Bald. Now if we look back and we think of that equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius that we saw in Rome, you can see the great similarities here. But you can also notice that it's a little bit more rounded and it's a little bit more simplified than that original sculpture. Also, the other one is lifelike, is life-size, and this is nine and a half inches tall. Illustrated books were important in Carolingian times as the rulers sought to promote learning and to spread Christianity throughout their region. Now, they had these imperial workshops where they would bring in great artists to transcribe the gospel, to correct, quote, to make corrections, and then to also to illustrate them. I always wonder about that when they say that they cleared up discrepancies in the gospel. I wonder who decided that. It's just something that I get curious about. Well, there was a guy named Alcuin of York, and he made something called the Latin Vulgate Bible. And this became the standard text of the Bible beginning in about 850 A.D. through the Middle Ages. And it's actually still in use today. So the term Vulgate, it just means for the common people in this case. Now, there are several different examples of illustrated books. And what they usually reflect is the characteristic of the, uh, of the illustrator who... Um, painted the illustrations. This one is really amazing when you look at all the swirly lines and the passion that the artist put in the face of Saint Matthew the Evangelist as he's writing down the holy text. So if you're going to have magnificently illustrated books you better have a good cover and this one is a spectacular cover that was created in the year 870 to 880. Now what's interesting is that it was a, taken from its original book and put on another book in about the 9th century, or that would be the, in, in the 900s. If you look at this one, it's kind of hard to see here, but let me tell you what it's made of. Basically, the material is gold, but it has pearls, garnets, sapphires, and emeralds also included. So this is a spectacular, spectacular example of the Carolingian metalwork. 
As the millennium came to a close, there was a group called the Ottonians that were in Austria and Germany. And this is a prime example of their work. It's a crucifix that actually has a hole at the back of the head to put the host in. It's life-sized. 